the New Testament. If you open up a Bible to its table of contents, you'll see it's made up of two large collections, the Old and New Testaments. The word testament refers to a covenant partnership, which is what both of these collections are all about. They tell one epic and complicated story of God's covenant partnership with Israel and all humanity. The Old Testament is called Tanakh in Jewish tradition. It's a unified scroll collection of 39 Israelite texts that were over a thousand years in the making. In contrast, the 27 books of the New Testament all came into existence within 30 to 40 years of each other. They were all written by first generation followers of Jesus. From an early period, Christian communities began collecting these texts and reading them alongside the Old Testament as one unified story that leads to Jesus. The New Testament begins with four narrative books that together are called the Gospel. They tell the story of Jesus of Nazareth's life, death, and resurrection as an announcement of good news. They're followed by a fifth narrative work called Acts of the Apostles. Here, the risen Jesus commissions the apostles, a word that means the sent ones. They're appointed as Jesus' representatives to spread the good news about him throughout the ancient world. After Acts comes a collection of letters from the apostles. These were written to provide teaching and guidance for local communities of Jesus' followers called churches. There are 13 letters connected to the Apostle Paul, and they're not arranged in the order of when they were written, but rather from the longest to the shortest. Then there's the letter to the Hebrews, written by a close but unnamed associate of the Apostles. After this are the letters of James, Jude, Peter, and John. Two were brothers of Jesus, and two were among his first followers. The last New Testament book is the Revelation, a letter to seven churches that reveals a prophetic word of challenge and comfort to all of Jesus' followers. So those are the books of the New Testament, but what are they about? And how do they connect with the Old Testament to make up one unified story? Think of it this way. The Bible is one long epic narrative with multiple movements or acts. The Old Testament recounts the first series of acts that give you everything you need to make sense of the story to follow. The core themes and the plot conflict are arranged in design patterns. And then in the New Testament, these are all picked up and carried forward to the story's culmination in Jesus. Let me show you what I mean. The first act is about God and all humanity. God provides a sweet garden temple for humans who are made to be God's partners in ruling the world. But the humans are foolish and they give in to a dark temptation and rebel against God's wisdom. So they're exiled into a wilderness where they start killing each other. They build cities that spread their selfishness and oppression leading up to the big bad city of Babylon. But God loves the world and its foolish humans, so he sets in motion a rescue plan by promising the arrival of a new human who will destroy the evil that has lured us into self-destruction. The next act of the biblical story is about God and Israel, and it develops the themes and patterns of the first act. God calls a new humanity out of Babylon into a sweet garden land, Abraham, Sarah, and his descendants, the Israelites. God promises that through them, divine blessing will be restored to all of the nations. Surely these are the new humans that we're waiting for. But the Israelites repeat humanity's rebellion against God, building their own violent cities that lead to self-destruction and another exile in Babylon. But God sustains his promise that the new human will come from Abraham's lineage. It will be a priest king who will now have to rescue both Israel and humanity from Babylon to restore God's blessing to the world. Now, notice how these two acts are designed according to the same pattern. The second act is a longer and more violent version of the first, and together they explore the tragic human condition, but they also highlight God's promise, which is developed more in the next act, the Old Testament prophets and poets. The prophets accused Israel and all nations of their evil, and they announced that one day God himself would arrive to bring the day of the Lord and deliver his world from Babylon. He would do it through a promised royal priest, who's going to suffer like a slave and die for the sins of Israel and all humanity, but then he'll be exalted as king over the nations. He will call others to leave Babylon and join the new covenant people who will partner with God to rule over a new Jerusalem, that is, over a new creation. And so the Old Testament concludes by anticipating a new act in the story. And when you turn to the New Testament, it's the same story now being carried forward in Jesus. Let's see how. The four gospel accounts introduce Jesus of Nazareth, both as the promised son of Abraham who will restore God's blessing to the nations, and also as that new human who will defeat evil and restore humanity to partnership with God. So Jesus is portrayed as a human and more. He went about announcing the arrival of God's promised kingdom, and he spoke and acted as if he was Israel's divine king. 
But instead of calling himself king, Jesus referred to himself as the son of man, that is, the human one who would act like a servant. The Gospels are making the claim that in Jesus, Israel's God has become the faithful Israelite and the true human that we are all made to be but have failed to be. Jesus' mission was to confront that dark evil that lurks underneath humanity's evil, luring us into selfishness, violence, and death. But how do you defeat that kind of evil? The surprising answer in the Gospels is that Jesus overcame our evil by allowing it to kill him on his paradoxical throne, the cross, where Jesus died for humanity's evil and sin. And it's where he lived out what he taught that nonviolence, forgiveness, and self-giving love are the most powerful things in the universe. And because God's love for his world is stronger than evil or death, Jesus was raised to new life as the prototype of a new humanity, and this brings us to the story of Acts. Through the Spirit, God empowers Jesus' followers to spread the life and love of Jesus out into the world as they invite people to leave their old humanity and join Jesus' multi-ethnic family, the new humanity. This is where the letters from the apostles fit into the story. Here the apostles address early Christian communities and they show how the good news about the risen King Jesus changed history and should reshape every part of our lives. They also explained the good news by constantly appealing to stories from the Old Testament and the story of Jesus, showing us how to see our own life stories as part of the epic biblical story. So all humanity is trapped in a Babylonian exile, but Jesus came to create a new home. We're all living in different kinds of Egyptian slavery to selfishness and sin, but Jesus died as the Passover lamb to liberate us into the promised land. Our old humanity is bound for the dust of death, but Jesus' resurrection opened up a new future for a new humanity. We live here in the current evil age, but through Jesus and the Spirit, a new creation has burst open here and now. And this leads us to the book of Revelation, where the whole biblical story comes together in powerful symbolism and imagery. Jesus is portrayed as a slaughtered, bloody lamb who is exalted as the divine king of the world. He's leading his people out of slavery and exile in Babylon. And as they resist Babylon's influence, they may have to suffer alongside their slain leader. But when you follow the risen king, not even death can prevent the dawn of the new creation, which is here depicted as a new Jerusalem garden temple, the true home of humanity after its long exile. And so on the Bible's last page, heaven and earth are reunited and the new humans take up their appointed task from the Bible's first page to rule the world together in the love and power of God. The New Testament is a remarkable collection of documents. They represent the testimony of the apostles that points us to the risen Jesus himself. And through God's Spirit, these human words have been speaking a divine word of hope from the first century to the 21st. Each book shows how God, through Jesus and the Spirit, is leading our world to its ultimate goal in a renewed creation. And so the story's end is really the beginning of a new story that is yet to be told. And that's what the New Testament is all about. The Gospel According to Luke It's one of the earliest accounts of Jesus' life, and it's actually part one of a unified two-volume work, Luke Acts. If you compare the opening lines of both of these books, it's clear that they come from the same author. And there are internal clues in the book of Acts, as well as an early tradition that identifies the author as Luke, the traveling companion and co-worker of Paul the Apostle, who we know was also a doctor. Luke opens his work with a preface telling us how and why he wrote this book. He acknowledges that there's many other fine accounts of Jesus' life out there, but he wanted to go back to the eyewitness traditions of as many early disciples as he could in order to produce what he calls an orderly account about the things that have been fulfilled among us. Now that word fulfilled shows us why Luke wrote this account. For him, the story of Jesus isn't just ancient history. He wants to show how it's the fulfillment of the long covenant story of God and Israel, and bigger than that, of the story of God in the whole world. The book's design is fairly clear. There's a long introduction that sets up the stories of John the Baptist and Jesus. Then in chapters 3 to 9, Luke presents a robust portrait of Jesus and his mission in his home region of Galilee. After that, the large midsection of the book is Jesus' long journey to Jerusalem, which leads to the story's climax, Jesus' final week in Jerusalem leading up to his death and resurrection, which then leads on into the book of Acts. In this video, we're just going to focus on the first half of Luke's gospel. 
The extended introduction tells in parallel the birth stories of John the Baptist and Jesus. So you have this elderly priestly couple, Zechariah and Elizabeth, and then this young unmarried woman, Mary and Joseph. They both receive an unlikely divine promise that they're going to have a son. Both promises are fulfilled then as John and then Jesus are born, and both parents sing poems of celebration. Now these poetic songs, they're filled with echoes from the Old Testament Psalms and prophets, showing how these children will fulfill God's ancient promises. But these poems also preview each child's role in the story to follow. So John is the prophetic messenger promised in the Torah and the prophets who's going to prepare Israel to meet their God. And Jesus, he's the messianic king promised to David who's going to bring God's reign over Israel and God's blessing to the nations just like he promised to Abraham. After this, Mary brings Jesus to the Jerusalem temple for his dedication, and two elderly prophets, Anna and Simeon, they see Jesus and they recognize who he is. And Simeon sings his own song, a poem inspired by the prophet Isaiah. He says, this child is God's salvation for Israel, and he will become a light to the nations. So with all this anticipation, the story moves forward into the next main section where Luke presents Jesus and his mission. He sets the stage with John's renewal movement at the Jordan River where he's calling a new, repentant, recommitted Israel into existence through baptism. He's preparing for the arrival of God's kingdom. And then Jesus appears as the leader of this new Israel and he's marked out by the spirit and the voice of God from heaven. He is the beloved son of God. After this, Luke follows with the genealogy, and it traces Jesus' origins back to David, then back to Abraham, and then all the way back to Adam from the book of Genesis. Luke's claiming here that Jesus is the messianic king of Israel who will bring God's blessing, but not only to Israel, the family of Abraham. He is here for all the sons of Adam, for all humanity. After this, Luke has strategically placed the story of Jesus going to his hometown, Nazareth, where he launches his public mission. At a synagogue gathering, Jesus stands up and he reads from the scroll of Isaiah, saying, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor and freedom for the prisoners, new sight for the blind, and freedom for the oppressed. Now, along with the other Gospels, Jesus is presented here. He's the Messianic King bringing the good news of God's kingdom. But what Luke uniquely highlights are the social implications of Jesus' mission. So he brings freedom. The Greek word is aphasis. It literally means release, and it refers to the ancient Jewish practice of the year of Jubilee described in Leviticus 25. It's when all Israelite slaves were released, when people's debts were canceled, when land that was sold is returned back to families. It's all a symbolic reenactment of God's liberating justice and mercy. And then Jesus says that this good news of release is specifically for the poor. Now, in the Old Testament, the poor, or in Hebrew, ani, it's a much broader category than just people who don't have very much money. It refers also to people of low social status in their culture, like people with disabilities or women and children and the elderly. It also can include social outsiders, like people of other ethnic groups or people whose poor life choices have placed them outside acceptable religious circles. And Jesus says that God's kingdom is especially good news for these people. So after this, Luke immediately puts in front of us a large block of stories showing us what Jesus' good news for the poor looks like. It involves the healing of a bedridden sick woman or a man who has a skin disease or someone who's paralyzed. There are stories here also about Jesus welcoming into his community a tax collector like Levi, who's not financially poor, but he is a social outsider. There's a story about Jesus forgiving a prostitute. Luke's showing us how Jesus' kingdom brought restoration and reversal of people's whole life circumstances. He's expanding the circle of people who get invited in to discover the healing power of God's kingdom. And as Jesus' mission attracts a large following, he does something even more provocative. He forms these people into a new Israel by appointing over them the 12 disciples as leaders corresponding to the 12 tribes of Israel. And then Jesus teaches his manifesto of an upside-down kingdom, or as Luke calls it, the sermon given on the plain. 
He says, God's love for the outsider and the poor means that his kingdom brings a reversal of all of our value systems. He is here to form a new alternative people of God who are going to respond to Jesus' invitation by practicing radical generosity, by serving the poor. People who are going to lead by serving and live by peacemaking and forgiveness. People who are deeply pious but who reject religious hypocrisy. Now, Jesus' radical kingdom vision, his claim to divine authority, it starts to generate resistance and controversy, especially from Israel's religious leaders. His outreach to questionable people, it's a threat to their religious traditions and their sense of social stability. And so they start accusing Jesus of blaspheming God, of being a drunk and mixing with sinners. And so this section culminates in a new revelation of Jesus' mission to his disciples. He says that Yes, he is the messianic king and that he's going to assert his reign over Israel by dying in Jerusalem, by becoming the suffering servant king of Isaiah 53 who dies for the sins of Israel. And then the shocking idea, it gets explored in the next story as Jesus goes up a mountain with three of his disciples and he's suddenly transformed in front of them. They're enveloped in this cloud of God's presence who announces, this is my chosen son. And then Moses and Elijah are there, the two other prophets who encountered God's presence and voice on a mountain. And Luke tells us that they're talking together about Jesus' exodus that he was about to fulfill in Jerusalem. Now that Greek word exodus, it's a clear reference to the exodus story. Luke is portraying Jesus here as a new Moses who will lead his newly formed Israel into freedom and release from the tyranny of sin and evil in all of its forms, personal, spiritual, and social. And that's going to lead us into the second half of the book. But for now, that's the first half of the Gospel according to Luke. Luke, Luke 1. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now while he was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you, and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple, and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. 
and when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. In the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him Zechariah after his father. But his mother answered, No, he shall be called John. And they said to her, None of your relatives is called by this name. And they made signs to his father inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And they all wondered. And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed, and he spoke, blessing God. And fear came on all their neighbors. And all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, 
For he has visited and redeemed his people, and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. The Gospel According to John it's one of the earliest accounts of Jesus' life, and we learn at the end of the book that it comes from one of Jesus' closest followers called the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, he appears many times in the story itself, and there's some debate about whether it's John the son of Zebedee, one of the twelve, or a different John who lived in Jerusalem and was known in the later church as John the Elder. Whichever John it was, the book embodies his eyewitness testimony, and it's been brilliantly designed with a clear purpose that he states near the end. John says, the story is written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that by believing you may have life in his name. John believes that the Jesus you read about in this book is alive and real and that he can change your life forever. The book's design is really cool. Its first half opens with an introductory poem and a short story that's followed by then a big block of stories about Jesus performing miraculous signs that generate increasing controversy. And it all culminates in his greatest sign, the raising of Lazarus, which creates the greatest controversy as Israel's leaders decide to kill Jesus. And that launches into the book's second half. These chapters focus on Jesus' final night and last words to his disciples, which are followed by his arrest, trial, death, and resurrection. The book concludes with an epilogue. In this video, we're just going to focus on the first half. So the book opens with a two-part introduction. First, a poem that begins, in the beginning, was the Word, an obvious allusion to Genesis 1, when God created everything with his Word. Now, a person's words, they're distinct from that person, but they're also the embodiment of that person's mind and will. And so John says that God's Word was with God, that is distinct. And yet the word was God, that is divine. And as we ponder this claim, we hear later in the poem that this divine word became human in Jesus. Then John goes on to draw from the stories of Exodus, saying that Jesus was God's tabernacle in our midst. The glorious divine presence that hovered over the Ark of the Covenant became a human in Jesus. Which leads to his last claim, that the one true God of Israel consists of God the Father and the Son, who has become human to reveal the Father to us. Now, as we consider these mind-bending claims, we then start to hear a story about how John the Baptist first met Jesus and then led other people to meet him and become his disciples. And one by one, as people encounter Jesus, they say out loud who they think he is. And in this one chapter, Jesus is given seven titles. Now, these titles prepare us for John's love of sevens in designing the book, but altogether they also make a claim that this fully human Jesus from Nazareth is the messianic king, he's the teacher of Israel, and he's the son of God who will die for the sins of the world. Now that's a big claim to make about someone, and John will now go on to support it through the stories in chapters 2 through 12. They all have the same basic pattern. Jesus will perform a sign or make a claim about himself, and that will result in misunderstanding or controversy. And so in the end of each story, people are forced to make a choice about who they think Jesus is. The first section shows Jesus encountering four classic Jewish institutions, and in each case, Jesus shows that he is the reality to which that institution pointed. So Jesus is at a wedding party, and the wine runs out. 
And Jesus then turns these huge jugs of water, like 120 gallons total, into the best wine ever. And the head waiter says to the groom, you've saved the best wine for last. Which is, of course, true. But John also calls this miracle Jesus' first sign. In other words, it's a symbol that reveals something about Jesus. So just as Isaiah said that the Messianic kingdom would be like this huge party with lots of good wine, so this first miraculous sign reveals the generosity of Jesus' kingdom. Next, Jesus goes to the Jerusalem temple, the place where heaven and earth were supposed to come together and God would meet with his people. And Jesus asserts his authority over it, running out all the money exchangers, stopping the sacrificial offerings. And when the temple leaders threaten him, he says, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Jesus is claiming that his coming sacrificial death is where heaven and earth will truly meet together. His body that will be killed is the reality to which the temple building points. Then Jesus has this all-night conversation with a rabbi named Nicodemus who thinks that Jesus is just like him, another rabbi and teacher for Israel. But Jesus says that Israel needs much more than just another teacher with new information. Israel needs a new heart and a new life. Or in his words, no one can experience God's kingdom without being born again. Jesus believes that humans are caught in a web of selfishness and sin that leads to death. But he also knows that God loves this world. And so he's here to offer people a new birth, a new chance at life. From here, Jesus travels north and he ends up at a sacred well in a conversation with a Samaritan, that is a non-Jewish woman. And they start talking about water, which Jesus turns into a metaphor for himself. He says he's here to bring living water that can become a source of eternal life. Now in John, this term refers to a new quality of life, one that's infused with God's eternal love, and it's a life that can begin now and last on into the future. After this, John has designed another collection of stories that took place during four Jewish sacred days or feasts. And again, Jesus uses the images related to the feasts to make claims about himself. So Jesus first heals a paralyzed man on the Sabbath, which starts a controversy with the Jewish leaders about working on the day of rest. And Jesus says it's his father who's working on the Sabbath, and so is he. And they catch his meaning, that he was calling God his father, making himself equal with God, and so they want to kill him. The next story takes place during Passover, the feast that retold the Exodus story with the symbolic meal of the lamb and bread and wine. And Jesus miraculously provides food for a crowd of thousands, which results in people asking him for more bread. And then Jesus goes on to claim that he is the true bread, and if they eat him, they will discover eternal life. And this offends many people who stop following him. After this is a block of stories set in Jerusalem during the Feast of Tabernacles, which retold the story of Israel's wilderness wanderings as God guided them with the pillar of cloud and fire and provided them water in the desert. And Jesus gets up in the temple courts and he shouts, If anyone is thirsty, let them come to me and drink. And then later he says, I am the light of the world. He's claiming to be the illuminating presence of God and the life-saving gift of God to his people. And some people believe and follow him, but others are offended and still others try to kill him for these exalted claims. The final feast story is during Hanukkah, which means rededication. It's about how Judah Maccabee cleared the temple of idols and set it apart as holy once more. And Jesus goes into the temple area and says that he is the one whom God has set apart as the Holy One, and that he is the true temple where God's presence dwells. And he also says, I and the Father are one. This makes the Jerusalem leaders so angry, they set in motion a plan to kill Jesus, and so he retreats from the city. Now all these conflicts, they culminate in one last miraculous sign. Jesus hears that his dear friend Lazarus is sick, but his family lives near Jerusalem, which is now a death trap for Jesus. Now, Jesus could stay away and he would save his own life, but he loves Lazarus. So once he hears that Lazarus has died, he goes to raise him from the dead and he calls him to life out of his tomb, knowing that it will cost him his own life. And the news of this amazing sign, it spreads quickly, of course, and just as Jesus knew it happened, the Jerusalem leaders hear about it and begin conspiring to murder him. And so he rides into Jerusalem as Israel's king who's rejected by its leaders. 
So the first half of John draws to a close with this story about Jesus laying down his life as an act of love for his friend. And this, of course, is also a sign pointing forward to the cross, which we'll explore more in the next video. But for now, that's the first half of the Gospel of John. John, John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about Him and cried out, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because He was before me. And from His fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. So they said to him, Who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, then why are you baptizing, if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him, and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes the man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. The next day again John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following, and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, Where are you staying? He said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, 
which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, So you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man.